let's get into this message today. Are you ready for this? I said, are you ready for this? Hey, if you are with us for the first time, maybe you're a returning guest, but you haven't been with us in a while, we're in this learning series called Chasing Eagles. Somebody say, Chasing Eagles. You need to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any of these messages. It's a new message every week, and this is really important for the body of Christ, for the church, for just people in general, I believe, to hear this message in particular, especially coming out of the year 2020. Chasing eagles. This came in my heart. I was listening to a podcast, and a guy was talking about a scripture that he read that talked about how you shouldn't chase after money because money will sprout wings like butterflies and fly away. And I thought, I've never heard the word butterfly used in any sermon. I've read the entire Bible, I'm pretty sure, and I don't remember seeing the word butterfly. So I thought to myself, let's go look this up. And I found it in Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. It's not butterflies, but here's what it says. It says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they're gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an Eagle. It says eagle. Somebody say eagle. And so this idea behind this learning series that we're in, Chasing Eagles, is talking all about how as followers of Jesus, we should not be focusing our attention on money. We shouldn't chase after money because the more you chase after money, the more money will just fly off. The more money is going to disappear. The more you make decisions based on what you don't have and how much money you think you need to have or what you want in your life, and you don't put the kingdom of God first financially in your life, money will begin to run away quickly. I don't get a lot of feedback on these messages, and I know why, because it's convicting. But I want to tell you something. God put this in my heart for a reason, because we have a legacy to build at Revive Church. If you have your Bibles today, I want to be in three places in the Bible. If you have a Bible, pull it out, and don't say, I don't have a Bible. You have a cell phone, you can Google this real quick. Proverbs chapter 3, Luke chapter 6, and Luke chapter 16. So two books in the Bible, Proverbs and Luke. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6 and Luke chapter 16. Let me give you a quick recap. In week one, we talked about how we need to learn to train eagles, because if we can train eagles, or if we can train money God's way, money will chase after us instead of us having to chase after money. God has designed it. He has given us wisdom in the Bible that says if we will learn how to train our money his way, he will send money our way to provide for our every need and to provide for what his kingdom needs, for what the local church needs as well. Last week, I gave a message called Generational Tenth, and this is the foundation of what we've been uh, dealing with with the stretch offering. I believe that tithing is not generic generosity. It's generational generosity. The tithe in the Bible is called 10%. It's 10% of our increase of our income. So every time my wife and I get paid, the first thing we do is we take 10% and we put it into this local church. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, of course you're saying that. You're a pastor. You want our money. Yes, I do. And let me tell you why. Because without you giving, we don't turn the lights on. We don't go online around the world. The gospel doesn't get out through this system, through this process. God cannot bless us if we do not give as a church. So I do believe that you should be tithing if you're a follower of Jesus. Here's the second thing, though. I also believe that the tithe is not about the here and now. The tithe is about future generations. Because when the entire church, listen to me, when the entire church is unified behind simply tithing, 10% of our income goes into our local church, guess what gets to happen? We begin to build financially a legacy for the next generation. No debt plus everybody tithing equals a legacy for future generations. It means that our children and our children's children, the kids who are upstairs, I've said this before, there's probably a kid right now who is threatening to take his pants off, who's screaming at the top of his lungs, who's rebelling against everything that's happening in children's church right now upstairs with the revived kids. Guess what? He or she will be the next pastor of revived church. It's just the way it works. I know because that was me back in the day. But here's what I believe. I believe that we are not called in 2021 to be selfish with our finances. I believe that we're not called to give so that we can get. We're called to give so that we can give more and we can build a legacy so that our children and our children's children can carry on the work of Revived Church for generations to come and bring the gospel in ways we never thought possible. 
Lord, bless the six, seven people who just say amen to that and believe that. I'm dead serious. You think I'm playing? I'm not. I'm going to give you one more chance. Can you say amen that that is what we're called to do? All right, God, you can bless the rest of them as well. Today, I want to give you a message from this learning series I've titled Measuring Cups. Somebody say Measuring Cups. Measuring cups. I want to be in Proverbs chapter 3 first with you. If you don't understand uh, or if you don't know the Bible, maybe you've never read through it, uh, I have a a degree in biblical studies. I paid a lot of money uh, to study the Bible so that you don't have to. Uh, No, I'm kidding. I, I, I did that because that's what God called me to do. But I want to educate you a little bit. The book of Proverbs is written by several different authors, but one of the main authors is this guy named King Solomon. Now, maybe you've heard of David, David and Goliath, David the Goliath, the, the, the giant slayer. Okay, this is his son. His, name's, his son, son's name, excuse me, is Solomon. Solomon was given a gift of supernatural wisdom. God came to him one time and, and, and he spoke to him through his Holy Spirit. He said, I will give you anything you ask. What do you ask of me? If, it, if it's riches, I'll give you riches. If it's a legacy, I'll give you a legacy. What do you want? And he said, all I ask is wisdom to lead your people. And God said, I will give you wisdom, but I'll also give you great riches. I'll give you peace with your enemies. He said, I'll give you everything, all of my blessing, because you asked for this one thing, to lead people well with wisdom. So Proverbs is written through, by Solomon through his eyes of his experience in life, this wisdom that God gave him. And he writes a lot of different things, but in Proverbs chapter 3, he focuses a little bit on the financial aspect of wisdom. And here's what he writes in verses 9 and 10. He says, honor, somebody say honor. Honor, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. And then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I want to read that one more time. Honor. Say it again. Say honor. Honor Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Solomon drops these vision bombs. I mean, just wisdom bombs all throughout Proverbs. But in this particular one, he uses this word, first fruits. In the Bible, the word first fruits literally means first of your fruit. It's the first of what you build. It's the first of what you work for. Now, he's talking to an agricultural society. Now, we do not. Now, we might have a farmer in the house. I don't know. If you're growing something in central Arlington, it's probably not watermelons. And God bless you. Let's fix that real quick. But anyway, I know my church. Anyway, um... But, but agriculturally, what they would do is they would uh, take the first of their harvest, 10% of their harvest, and they would bring it to the temple to honor God. And, and they would honor God with their first fruits. It was their tithe agriculturally. Today, we get paid in cash, or maybe you get paid in like Bitcoin or Dogecoin or something today. I don't know. Uh, but, but we, as a modern day people, we believe in this covenant that God made. And and if you want to learn more about it, watch last week's message. But we bring 10% of our increase, of our income, of our, our fruit, our first fruit. The first time I really experienced the authenticity of first fruits was when we went to Honduras. And uh, I'll never forget, we were, we were in a, mountain area, a mountainous area with this village. We had had this church service out there. We're driving back and uh, driving through just the jungles. I mean, it was straight jungle. And, and I remember the pastor stopping the car and, and I'm like, what is going on? And all of a sudden, this, this husband and wife and a couple kids, they, they run out from the fields, and they've got this basket full of bananas. And, and they gave it to Luis Sorto, who was the, the pastor there. And, and uh, I was like, oh, look, that's a snack. That's so nice. They knew we were coming. And, and he said, no, no, no. He said, this is their tithe. He said, they don't have currency. They, they grow uh, banana fields in, in their yard, and, and they hide them from the government because the government will come and take it. But every time I come this way, every few weeks, they've gathered their first fruits from the harvest and they've brought it to me because they understand that I'm going to use it for the Lord. And Luis would, he would feed orphans, he would feed widows, he would feed uh, villages, Um, he had a school there, there's all kinds of things that he did. Uh, But that was my first experience with real, authentic, like first actual fruits. And it made me think how selfish we can get with our eagles when a family who has literally nothing according to America's standards would be so gracious to God and say, God, I trust you so much, I love you so much, I believe in you so much that literally you can have my first fruits. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth. Did you know the word wealth is relative? In fact, if you have right now a net worth of $4,210, you are one of the wealthiest people in the world. Do you know that? 
4,210, that's it, that's all you need. And you are wealthier than about 80% of the world's population. Now, in the Western culture, we think $4,210, that'll get me like a month's rent and some groceries. But literally, to the rest of the world, wealth, wealth is relative depending on your geographical location. Wealth is relative based on your vision. Wealth is a relative term. But I want you to understand, when Solomon wrote, honor the Lord with your wealth, he didn't say, honor the Lord if you are wealthy. He said, honor the Lord with your wealth. What I want to do today is I want to make it clear One of Jesus' most famous quotes about finances is found in Luke chapter 16. Let's look at this, what he says, starting in verse 10. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, Who will give you property of your own? If you take the time to read through this preceding parable and then this explanation that Jesus gives, there's a big thing that will stand out to you. It's that God believes that money belongs to him. Actually, let me take a step further. God actually believes that everything on the earth belongs to him. Not just money, like everything belongs to God. We don't act like that. We don't live like that. God puts it in his word because he believes it. Whether you do or not, he believes it. But Jesus takes a leap here, and he says, money is not the most valuable riches on the earth. He says people are. And here's the way that Jesus prepares us for this statement. He says, if, if you can be trusted with very little, you can also be trusted with much. If you, can be trusted, if you can be dishonest with very little, you'll be dishonest with much. He said, if you cannot be trusted with worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with people? In other words, let me say it this way. If you ain't got your money together, why would God give you influence in his kingdom? Let me take it a step further. Money is simply a test of your heart. Money, the, the money, money in general, no matter how much or how little you have, money is relative. Wealth is relative, but money is God's test to see, can I trust you with people? Because if you personalize, if you personify money and you put it above me, then who knows how you're going to treat people when I put them in your realm of influence? God says, I, I, gotta be, I, gotta, I got to know that I know that I know that I can trust you. Let me take it a step further because I feel like the Holy Spirit's pushing on this. Maybe the reason God's not answering your prayers about finances is because he can't trust you with finances. Maybe the reason God cannot trust you, he can't answer that prayer about a spouse, about whatever it is, about your relationship, about why your kids are acting, because he, he can't trust you with money yet. And if he gave you influence in, in one area with people when you can't be trusted with money, if you ruin money, something that is just here today and gone tomorrow, literally can sprout wings and fly off like an eagle, really is not that important to God. If you can't be trusted with this little piece of paper with an eagle printed on it, how in the world can you be trusted with God's most valuable resource, an image bearer on the earth, a young child, a spouse, a friend, a, a, an employee? I mean, how can you... How can you? Money is really just, it's the test. Jesus understands this idea of of currency and how we glorify it to a place where it is worshipped and lusted after. And Solomon clarifies, he says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And and then he uses this term, he says, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, your vats will be brim over with with new wine. Jesus says something similar, but he says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Somebody say give. Give. Say it like you mean it. Say give. 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 This statement is not a money statement. This is not a currency statement. This is not a first fruit statement. This is not a tithe statement from Jesus. Actually, this passage of Scripture has nothing to do with money, but it is relative to money. 
When Jesus says give, he is talking about the posture of your heart. And he gives us a statement that the world has twisted into things like, you know, karma, you reap what you sow, whatever. But he says it this way. He says, whatever you give, it will be given back to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be poured into your lap. That's why some of y'all's lap hurts so much, because you've been putting some gossip out there, and some hatred out there, and some contempt out there, and some factions out there, and some Facebook posts out there, and you're wondering why you're receiving it back. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God says, whatever you give, it will be given back to you. Like, that's his, that's his promise. That's how God has installed the universe, that this is how it works. There's a spiritual element out there that God has put into works that no matter what you believe, you can call it whatever you want, but Jesus said it first, y'all. Give, and it shall be given back to you. If you don't have joy, you haven't given joy out. If you don't have peace, you haven't given peace out. If you're wondering why you can't get folks to pray for you, maybe it's because you haven't started praying for other people first. If you ain't got friends, it's because you act, ain't acted friendly yet. I'm just trying to get you to understand what Jesus was saying. Because if I just go into money, you'll just disregard everything I'm saying today. But he also says, give and it shall be given unto you. This is also a financial statement. Give financially and it will be given financially back to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your life. But he says this term, for with the measure, the measure you use, it will be given back back to you. To close out this message, I wanted to walk you through, oh, that's my offering for today, Lord Jesus. Don't let nobody, don't let nobody take that stretch offering. I will knock you out. I want to walk you through um, my personal journey with this. If you'll allow me. Can you help me? Can you take this? Thank you. Just be real careful there. I want to walk you through my um, personal experience of what this looks like and how this has turned out in my life. Um, it all started when I was um, about 10 years old, and uh, I know it's really dark over here, so I'll stand here. Um, I was about 10 years old, and my, my great-grandpa, Alden Barker, yeah, he was from like the backwoods of some state. I don't know where. Uh, but Alden Barker, Grandpa Barker, um, he, he was in his late 70s, early 80s, I think, and he um, needed his, his grass mowed. And my dad offered to, to mow the grass, and I'll, I'll never forget, because my dad would bring me over to Grandpa Barker's house, and, and he would load up his lawnmower and his weed eater and his edger, and then we would go out, and I was 10 years old, and so I would mow according to a 10-year-old standards. It, do, it doesn't quite look good, you know. But what would happen is my, my grandpa would, would pay $20 every time we mowed. And my dad would take 10, and then he would give me 10. And I was real upset about that because I thought, this was my agreement with my, grand, my grandpa. I feel like you should give me the full 20. My dad made it clear to me. He, he taught me about how businesses work. He said, I am the CEO, the CFO, the COO. <laughs> he said, I own the lawnmower, the gas that went in the lawnmower. I own the, the weed eater and the edger and the gas that went in those. I owe the truck that got you here, and I own that. I also own the fuel I put in it. So $10, $10 half is my share of your work. And not only that, but I had to go back behind you and fix everything you messed up in the lawn. But I remember, I remember mowing, and this is of the devil now. I don't do this anymore. I don't do this. Praise God. I don't do this anymore. I know people love being outside and doing that. I do not. Um, but I remember specifically, I, I, I mowed my grandpa's yard 10 times that, that summer. And I, the reason I know it was 10 times is because I had $100 left over at the end of the summer. And it was exciting. 10-year-old, $100, that might as well have been a billion. I was Jeff Bezos back in whatever year that was, 1996. I was $10 a lot, $100 by the end of the summer. I came back to school and I was like, y'all, I'm throwing down dollar bills. I was so rich. My friends were like, how'd you get $100? Boy, I went up there, mowed some lawns. I got my own business and stuff. <laughs> but I remember coming out of that summer, our children's church was raising money for um, a missions project or something we were doing with kids. I don't exactly remember, but 
Uh, I remember it, it was very clear to me, it was vivid, by the way, y'all can use this. Um, so what we did was the boys and the girls would raise money separately. If the boys raised enough money, one of the boys got chosen to put a pie in the face of one of the girls and vice versa. And so I was like, y'all, we need to give generously on every occasion because one of us is going to put a pie in a girl's face. Like that's every 10-year-old boy's dream, right? No repercussions on this. But I remember they were raising money, and I was only 10, but I remember very clearly having this, this unction, you can call it whatever you want, but I know it was the Holy Spirit, and, and he told me to give all $100 to this little kid's offering. Like, we raised like a total of like $112 with my 100 right? I mean, we won, and I did get to, I almost found the picture. I couldn't find the picture, but I did put a pie in a girl's face. But, but I remember the Holy Spirit saying, I want, I want you to give all $100, 10 years old, $100. That was, a, that was a lot of money for me. But I said, okay, I'm going to give it. So I, I gave it to our kids' ministry. Didn't really think much of it after that. You know, you're a kid. You have a ADDDDD constantly. You just get distracted. Until about five or six years later, and I was working as the janitor at our church. And um, again, not really doing the best job. Had somebody who had to clean up after me, like even though I cleaned up, you know, and so I, that's why I'm real um, lenient with our team here. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I was a janitor, and I remember we started out, minimum wage back then was $6 an hour. I was so excited to make $6 an hour. You're 15, you know. $6 an hour is like the best, and first paycheck was $90, I'll never forget, but I was 15, didn't have a girlfriend, so what do you do? You save money, and so I started saving money, and I had saved up um, $1,000, and for a 15-year-old, $1,000, I'm practically a billionaire. <laughs> it was a lot of stinking money to have $1,000, and I remember having this thousand dollars because I, I kept it in cash and I thought I was sneaky. Like, by the way, teenagers, you're not fooling your parents. You're, you're not hiding anything. They know where everything is and what you're doing and all that crap. I tried to hide my thousand dollars in an envelope in one of the children's books that was left in my bedroom by my parents, thinking for sure they wouldn't find it. And later I found out they knew where it was because they would go through my room like every few weeks. But But I remember our church was raising money at the time uh, for a missions project. And I remember going home one day and pulling out that envelope of 10 $100 bills because I converted it to cash because back then I didn't have a bank account. And again, I just heard this voice, this unction, this prodding, like however you want to put it, it was the Holy Spirit. And he said, give me all $1,000. It was a little bit harder as a 15-year-old. But I remember going, okay, God, I'll do that. Fast forward about six years, seven years, and I was working for our church again, but I had been upgraded and promoted, praise the Lord. Uh, I was working in our media department. I was the head of the media at the time, and I was making very foolish financial decisions around that time. If you've heard my story before, I tried to buy a house when I was 19 years old. Had no business buying a house. Um, I had all kinds of debt. I mean, school debt, credit card debt, quick cash payday loan debt, you know, those places who offer you like 38% interest on a $2,000 loan, and over time you end up paying them $287,000 back. Like, I had debt on debt on debt. But I remember specifically... Um, our church was, again, they were doing a, a building project at the time, and I had, I had saved up enough to where I had $1,000 in my checking, $1,000 in my savings. Now, this time I'm in my early 20s, like, so now I'm supposed to be a little bit more responsible, even though I was making stupid decisions with money. $1,000 in checking, $1,000 in savings, and I remember God specifically on a Sunday morning while I was at work at the church telling me, go home right now, get your checkbook and give that $2,000 to me. And that was very hard to do because I was already strapped financially. I was already in a bad place and I knew it. Here's what I didn't know. I wrote that check, 
I gave it to the church I was a part of. Y'all are going to love this part. Big twist. You ready for this? Seven days later, I got fired. <laughs> got laid off. By the way, don't come ask me what I got fired for. It ain't none of your business. <laughs> it was a misunderstanding. Um, But I gave that $2,000, and with almost $300,000 in debt, was sitting there with no money the next week, going over to my parents' house and just weeping uncontrollably. I didn't know what I was going to do. Fast forward about, I don't know, but I remember the year was 2015, and um, I had, um, our church had gone to um, Honduras. We were in this um, relationship with a um, a pastor there, Luis Sorto, who you heard me mention, and we were in Honduras, and he took us to this uh, field in the middle of the mountains, and two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, like clockwork, these Hondurans just start scattering out from the villages to meet us in this field. And all of a sudden, we just start hearing like singing and rejoicing, and I mean, it's like a hundred of them. I mean, they just were coming out of nowhere. Like, they were living in the mountains, literally living in the mountains, living in the villages. And, and so, um, we had a church service out there under the sun. It was awful, but it was exciting at the same time, because I hate the sun, but I love worship, so, you know, you sacrifice. But I remember we got back that night, and I was asking Luis, like, what is it that draws these people? And he said, Stephen, I'll tell you, rain or shine, they are out there. They know that I'm coming with my guitar, my generator, and my little amplifier. They know that they are going to worship God. They know they're going to experience the presence of God. They will do anything to be out there. Same time, every Wednesday, they're out there. And I said, well, well that's amazing, man. He said, yeah. He said, you know, um, but I want to build them a church building. He said, I've been saving to, to build them a church building. And what you have to understand about... Um, different countries is the politics work different there. We complain about taxes. You have nothing to complain about when it comes to your taxes. They literally have government officials who, when they find out that you are trying to transfer resources, they will just take it all. Not a percentage, they'll just take it all from you. And he had had a lot of trouble with trying to get this. And by the way, when I say church building, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about your last mega church building. I'm talking about this little tiny cinder block building. He, he wanted to build a concrete foundation, put some cinder blocks up and put a roof up. And, and I said, how much more do you need? Uh, you know, what, what is the cost and all this? He's explaining it. He said, I only need $20,000 more. And I'm sitting in this little plastic chair just like this one, looking across from him. And I'll never forget, he said the words $20,000 and God said, you will supply everything that he needs. I was like, yeah, that ain't gonna happen. Because of what I asked him next, I said, well, how soon do you need the money? And there's a lot of reasons why, but he said, I need the money by the end of the year. This was mid-October 2015. He needed it by December 31st, 2015. So I went back to our church back in 2015. We were about 17 strong, and uh, everybody was a college student except for just a few of us, and uh, stood up, and I said, guys... God put this on my heart. And luckily, I waited just a little bit. I, came, I called him at, back up, and I said, how much do you need? And, and somebody had donated 10000 so we, God brought it down to 10000 Praise the Lord, he brought it down to 10000 So $10,000 off. And I said, Luis, you'll have it by the end of the year. I said, I, I just, you will. Didn't say I don't know how, even though that's what I'm thinking. I have no idea how. Stood up in front of our church, said, we need $10,000 by the end of the year, y'all. Y'all, our church went crazy for this. They were so excited to sacrificially give, to invest. We had, we had, uh, we had these young guys, Mark was there and, and Martin and, and man, they were given $5, $10, $8.50. We were balling out of control getting that 10,000 real quick. And, and I said, I need it by the end of the year. And, uh, and in 30 days, our church raised, um, Three thousand dollars. Three thousand. I had told this guy, "You will have ten thousand dollars by the end of the year." That's a big, bold statement from somebody who can only raise three thousand dollars with a bunch of college students in the church. 
And I was sitting at home, and God said, you know, I have the solution. I said, what's that? He said, you. I had been saving up in a retirement account, and um, God said, I want you to, because we didn't have money. By the way, I don't know if I clarified this. I was working for the church full-time for free. I didn't, I didn't have a paycheck from the church at that, that time. My wife was a bank teller. She was making roughly about $10 an hour back then. We were like barely sliding by, and God would provide miracles financially. But the one thing that I had done in the previous six years is I had started investing into my retirement, which I will talk about in this learning series. But he said, I want you to cash out your retirement. You pay the penalties. You pay the taxes and give me the rest. I hadn't really paid much attention to this retirement account, but once I took it out and I paid the penalties and I paid the taxes, and the reason why I'm saying I, not we, with my wife here is because at this time we had just been married for like a couple years and, and, and I knew that this was about me. It was really not about her. It was about me. And it came out to uh, the exact amount we needed, around $7,000. And so gave that $7,000 into this building project in Honduras, this little roof for these Hondurans in the middle of the mountains. Stick with me, because I know you're getting bored and you're like, this ain't my story. The reason why it can't be your story is because you're already zoning out on me and you don't even care. (laughs) So fast forward a few years and Revive is growing and I've got this massive metal pulpit that that weighs 300 pounds and (laughs) And I'm preaching, and, and we are, are seeing baptisms happen, and, and things are going really well. And at the time, uh, my wife had, a, had our first child, and um, things were going good for our family and for the church. And, um, and, I, and I'll never forget, it was, I believe it was 2016, near the end of the year, and I'm just praying about, God, you know, what is it that you uh, would, would have us give in the new year? Like, you know, we want to pray into this. And, and he, he gave me the, this declaration, this, this command that I'll never forget. Um, we had about, um, and let me be clear before I say this, I'm using these numbers because this is what the Holy Spirit told me to do. So I'm not bragging on us or anything, because for some of you, it's going to sound like a brag. For some of you, you're gonna sound, it's going to sound like we were poor at the time, okay? Depending on what your wealth relativity is. Um, but we had about $13,000 in our savings. We had just given, she had just given birth to our daughter, and um, God said, write a check for $10,000 and give it to the church and start the year off with generosity. That was scarier than mess because I had a kid and we had been, that was our emergency fund for emergencies. Like you go to the hospital, someone's dying, your air conditioner goes out. The church didn't even need the stinking money. The church was fine. And God said, write a check and give that. So I talked to Susanna, and Susanna is so amazing because it's like she has no concern in the world when God says give anything. I mean, I could be Abraham and Isaac, be like, we got to give our firstborn daughter up. She's like, okay, go ahead, sacrifice her. <laughs> if that's what God said, go for it. <laughs> and I remember the first Sunday of 2017 bringing that money in, and it was... It was, it was a little difficult, but I just remember thinking, God, this is your house, this is your money, and if this is what you tell me to do, I, I'm going to do that. And then in 2020, craziness ensues, and the world is burning, and, and at the same time, God gives us this vision to go online, and um, this is our YouTube channel. If you ain't subscribed to it, you need to. And God gives me this influence um, when I say worldwide, I don't mean millions of people worldwide, but we have people from other countries who tune in every week and they watch the videos and, like, and I'm preaching to people I've never met before, never seen before, and God gives me this level of influence. In the year 2020, y'all, I'm just going to brag on God, we paid off our house. Like we literally have zero debt whatsoever. Like That's God right there. And what, what here's, let me just be real with you, y'all. Going into 2021, I had plans for our money. Because not only did we pay off our house, but the government is writing fat checks. Just throw it, like I'm a stripper on the pole, baby, just throwing money at me. Go for it, Stephen, take whatever you need. (laughs) Trump and Biden are just making it rain. I 
that. We had so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. I had plans. I was like, honey, we're going to take some vacations. I'm going to upgrade my car. Y'all got like a 10-year-old car with 150,000 miles. It's time to upgrade. I was like, it's time to upgrade our wardrobe. Like, you know, we put our kids in a better daycare. We go get a better house. And 2021 hits, and, and, and 2020 hits, and, and God near the end, he's like, I want you to do something called a stretch offering. I'm like, what the heck is a stretch offering? He said, remember that word I gave you, that God, I'm going to stretch you? He said, I'm going to stretch your entire church. So I want you to take up four offerings through the year, one at the end of each quarter. And here's what I want you to instruct the church. This is what we're going to do together. At the end of each quarter, you're going to give something. And before that, leading up to it for three months, you're going to pray and ask God, God, what would you have me give? And instead of you working extra hard and you freaking out about how you're going to do it or taking out a loan, you're going to go to God and you're going to go, go, God, 2 Corinthians 9 says that you give seed to the sower and bread for food. So I know you're going to take care of my needs and you're going to give me the provision I need to sow into the house of God. So that's what we begin doing as a church. And this money is focused on building the vision and the legacy that God gave us to be the church of 2030. It's a 10-year vision. And we're investing online. We're investing in our resources. We're believing God for some more staff members. We need online pastors. We need full-time staff pastors because the church continues to grow. And by God, God is stretching our staff, the two of us that are here. But our capacity is filling quickly. And, and so we're believing God for all these things. And that money helps for us to be able to fast forward this vision that God gave us to, to do more, to reach more people. And I'm not going to tell you the number because, God, if I did, some of you would get up and leave just out of jealousy and spite. But literally every free penny we've had so far this year, let me put it to you this way. God told us, my wife and I, to commit in this stretch offering through the year more than all of these offerings combined. Amen. Don't say amen to that because it made me mad for a second. Because <laughs> I had a little bit of plans for this money. And here's what I realized that God was doing. Back when I was 10 years old, God gave me a measuring cup. And it was enough for $100. He said, give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be poured back into your lap. But first you have to use the measure, and then it'll be measured back to you. So are you willing to measure that $100 with your obedience against my promises to you? And I just, man poured it out. I was like, all right, God. And then, and then I hit 15, and I had this $1,000 teaspoon of, of measure, and, and it was a lot because it, it was full at the time. That was the capacity of a 15-year-old, $1,000. And God said, will, will you use the measure of what you have against your obedience? Will you trust my promises? And I said, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll pour that out, and God bless it. And then by God, I begin a new job, didn't make really good decisions. And here's what I want you to understand about this season in my life. That $2,000 was all I had. But I had made so many foolish decisions that this $2,000 was not about God's promise. This was about my heart and God trying to correct my finances. And he filled up this cup and he said, are you willing to pour this out and trust my promise? And I said, yes, Lord, I am. And so I poured it out. And then we, we get to Honduras and I'm like... Ooh, this cup is bigger, God. This is a big cup, but again, it's filled, and this is all that I have, God. And you're asking me to give all that I have, but, but I'm going to trust you because I've seen that the promise has worked so far up to this point. And so, God, I'm just going to pour out everything that I have, and, I, and I'll give it to you. And, and, and I did. And then the day came where God said, okay, now your measuring cup looks more like a vat. And, and I, begin, I begin to overflow your vat and, and, and can you trust me when I say pour out your vat and, and pour out the full measure of what I've given you? Can you trust me when I say that it's mine to begin with, but I promise with the measure you use, I'll pour it back into you if you will just trust me? And, and my wife and I say, yes, Lord, and we begin to pour out our vat of wine. And y'all, if I can just tell you right now, if I could put a barn on stage, by God, I would. Because now we are standing in the favor and the abundance of God, and our barns are filled to overflowing. 
going. And, and I don't know how exactly it happened. When I look back, I can't tell you there's an exact systematic mathematical equation that got us from point A to where we are now. But I can tell you this, there is something supernatural that happened that every time God gave us a measuring cup and it got a little bigger each time and we poured it back out, he didn't just pour out what we had given, he enlarged the measuring cup to the next level and then he poured into that till it was overflowing. Then he said, I want you to pour that out and then he would enlarge the measuring cup again. And what I'm trying to say is give and it shall be given unto you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will God cause men to give into your bosom, but with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you, but God doesn't measure by human standards, God measures by supernatural standards, and when you generically give, he will measure back to you exactly what you gave, but when you generationally invest into what God is doing, and you trust the Lord with your finances, and you stop making stupid decisions with your money, God will enlarge your measuring cup, and you'll go from a cough, a teaspoon cough medicine cup all the way to overflowing barns because that's the promise that God has given us. And so here's what we're doing. We're taking up the stretch offering. If you're a guest here, you don't have to engage in this. If you're a part of Revive, you don't have to engage with this. Because here's what I believe. Getting into this message, I realized something. The stretch offering didn't have nothing to do with y'all. Y'all are a byproduct. It had everything to do with me. Because every time that God tells me to give everything that we have back into the ministry, back into missions, back into someone's bank account, every time it has to do with this Stephen, can I trust you with what you have so that I can take you to the next level? And let me be very clear. I am not telling you to empty your bank account today. And let me be even more clear. If I find out that you did that because you heard this story and you thought, oh, if I give everything today, God will give me a hundredfold. I'll smack you around a little bit. With my words, graciously, because that's not your story. That's not your testimony. This is mine. This is my personal journey from measuring cup to measuring cup to measuring cup to, to overflowing vat of wine to overflowing abundant barns. This is my personal journey, but I wanted to share it because I want you to understand something. It wasn't about the amount. It wasn't the measure of the money. It was the measure of the obedience. Were you willing to obey with everything you have? That was God's challenge to me. Maybe in this stretch offering, maybe God's just challenging you $5. And that's like 0.001% of your net value. Can you obey in that level? If you can't obey in that level, I'm just going to promise you something. God will not enlarge your next measuring cup. He can't because he's true to his word. And if he can't trust you, here's where it come, becomes really great, is because every time that God told me to give, I want you to understand something. It, from measuring cup to measuring cup to, to vat of wine to overflowing abundant barns, every time the money did not go to just anything. It went into the investment of real people being introduced to the real Jesus. So when we give today and we invest this as a church, you will never see that money again in currency form. Week one, the eyes are the lamp of the body. Whatever you focus your eyes on is what you will chase after. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. That's what Jesus said. You'll never see this money again in currency form, but here's what you will see it in. You'll see it in the form of baptisms. You'll see it in the form of people giving their lives to Jesus. You'll see it in the forms of new campuses. You'll see it in the forms of new staff members who are focused on bringing the gospel around the world. You will see it in the form of children who come from broken homes, finding the hope and the revelation of who Jesus is, and for the first time in their lives, experiencing true, authentic love. You will find prostitutes and crack addicts and drug dealers giving up their lifestyle and their commitment to their sinful lives so that they can be free and stand in the freedom that Jesus gives. You'll see the people 
who are really, really good at hiding their sins, and they like to judge the prostitutes and the crackheads and the drug dealers because their sin is more exposed, whereas their sin is more hidden, and you'll see them come in, and they will begin to repent publicly because the Holy Ghost will fill them, and they will not be able to stop repenting until it's over. You, you will see a mighty move of God that you never thought you would experience. I'm not promising it's going to happen next week. I'm not promising it's going to happen in the next 24 hours. But here's what I am promising. If God gave us a 10-year vision and he's asking us to sow seed in the first year, it's because there's a harvest time coming. And when you sow seed in one season... And he gives you a vision for a decade in the future. It means somewhere along the line there will be a harvest. But here's what I believe. I believe that harvest will look like measuring cups. And God will pour out more measuring cup. And then a bigger measuring cup. And then a bigger measuring cup. I don't think that it's going to be seed time today and harvest back in 2030. What I believe God is doing is he's going to give us harvest here now in the near future. And he's going to give us seed in that harvest to sow. So that we can sow more seed and for more harvest and more harvest and more harvest. Some of y'all got family members who won't step in the church because they were hurt by church or you're the Christian that is showing them the fake Jesus, not the real Jesus and they're going to have a repentant spirit because of the Holy Spirit just because you are sowing seed today and you believe in the vision. There's going to be miracles that happen in this house because we are sowing financial seed but you'll never see it in currency form again once it's out of here. You give online, you ain't never going to see that money again in that form. But what you'll see is another opportunity, and slowly but surely over time, God's going to correct some things in your habits with money, and you're going to get things, some, some things sh- set straight, and then all of a sudden, God's going to say, hey, I want you to give this now, and you're going to go, wait, I don't have that. And you look at your bank account and go, oh, wait, I do have that. And then it'll happen again, and again, and again. But it starts with first fruits. It starts with first fruits.